Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, we're going to talk to the wonderful, fabulous, brilliant Catherine May today. She's here with us on screen. Hi, Catherine. Hi. I'm going to wave it back to you as well. I know. I was just saying, <laughs> she wrote this fabulous book. Look, and it is this month's Wild Reads pick. That's my book club for literati. And I make a habit of trying to chat with the authors of the books that I choose. I read this book, Wintering. Uh, the Power of Rest and Retreat in Difficult Times about this time last year. And I was so moved by it, Catherine. I felt like I wanted to reach across the miles and say, <laughs> you're a kindred spirit. You know, uh, we're very different, but there's so much of what you wrote in here that resonated with me. And I recommended the book to so many people. As you know, on Twitter, we met on Twitter yeah, because I said, yeah. read this book. And um, <laughs> so many people have thanked me for that. So beautiful book. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's an absolute honor. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you. Well, my club has been discussing your book and we've they've all loved it and been really um, as moved by it as I was. And I just wondered if you could tell us first, how did you come to write this book? What is the genesis story of Wintering? Would well, you know what it was? It was actually a very specific moment. I was uh, I was in a pub with my friend, and we were you know as you do putting the world to rights over a glass of wine, and she was just talking about how everything had been going wrong for her. You know, she she was grieving. Her career wasn't going so well. She just had a string of disasters, and she she was sort of saying, "Well, like I've just screwed up forever. That's it." You know, and I I could see in that moment that she was in the bottom of a dip. And I understood mm. the shape of that dip and I understood that it would end, you know, and, and that it feels like that to be there. And I, I found myself saying to her, you're just wintering at the moment. That's a really specific state of being and, and it, you will come out the other side. And I, I, I kind of went home and started making notes about this, this word wintering that had just come to me in that moment. Um, and I had to send her a very awkward text to say, I think I might write a book proposal about this. <laughs> You're okay with that, you know? <laughs> I promise not to mention you, but yeah, it, it, it just came into mind. I suddenly realised I had a perspective on it that, from experience, from bitter experience, that maybe other people didn't and that it was time right. we shared it, really. Yeah. So wintering is very much, you. well, you, we're going to talk about actual winter in a little bit mm. because you do write really powerfully about actual winter about cold, about the darkness, about snow, um, what animals do in winter. But I think most powerfully, and certainly where the story begins, you're talking about wintering as a metaphor. It, it can mm. be, you can be in a wintering season in your life in the middle of the summer, <laughs> at any time yeah. of the year. This is about those times. I mean, it's interesting when you say this, because I think that we are pretty familiar with when we think about things like people who are grappling with addiction for example or mm. or alcoholism or people who are you know we, we say they they hit rock bottom rock bottom you know? yeah and there's a there's yeah. like a framework for us to think about okay you've mm. now wrecked everything as your friend said i you know i've ruined everything yeah and but yeah. but there is this um we have this idea of there's a coming back from that and somehow mm. with just ordinary life and the ordinary struggles or sometimes not so ordinary struggles the difficult times in our lives sure we we don't yeah. have a language for it and i think that mm. you're right that wintering is in some ways a way to think about the seasons that are difficult yes and i also think that when we talk about rock bottom we see it as as like a point in a valley that you bounce straight back from Whereas for me, wintering is a is a space and a place that, that actually endures for a surprising amount of time. And we expect people to move on from it very quickly. But I wanted to explore and, and like open it up almost, this, this place you end up in for often like a really sustained period of time. And we're getting more familiar with that when we're thinking about grief, I think. You know, we're, we're beginning mm -hmm. to acknowledge that grief lasts longer than that kind of couple of weeks when everybody else notices it. But right. actually, it's a it's a space we have in common that, that I think we've all inhabited at one time or another. And if we haven't, it's it's coming. I hate to say it, but we will we will all land there one day. Absolutely, without question. <laughs> and and I think you know one of the things that I've certainly written about in my own work, and I give advice as dear sugar. I, I say this mm. kind of thing over and over. It's something that you write about so articulately. Is and it's right there even in the subtitle of your book. The 
the power of mm. wintering, the power of those times where we are either forced or we decide that we must retreat, rest, or or find a way through times that are difficult that we wouldn't um, welcome. What have you learned? Maybe let's talk a little bit about that. I mean, whether you're thinking about your own life or the lives of others, what is the power of rest and retreat? What what can those what can winter teach us? Mm, I mean, so much, and the lessons you draw from it are different every time. But it's always the site of a transformation, and you know, like sometimes that transformation is really unwelcome. It's it's not one you want to make, and so we resist it we fight it really hard right mm -hmm. and and you know we do everything we can to delay that winter coming and then once winter's here we deny it and we tell ourselves that you know we're just going to give it an extra push and we'll be out of it and actually i think if you can lean into the wintering as a phase as a season you get contact with the insights that come from that transformation and actually probably the transformation does happen a bit quicker and a lot less painfully um but it it's this space in which we make necessary change and necessary change is different to wanted change but it doesn't mean it isn't happening and you know even when terrible things are happening to us we have to make space to adapt to them and that that falling out of society that falling through the cracks that happens when we're wintering is actually an invitation to process that and to take a huge care of ourselves while we do it rather than to squash it all down and go back into the world and and try to suppress it it doesn't work it bursts out sometimes and like it, if if we don't acknowledge it if we don't walk with it it often comes out as as illness it makes us sick and so we get invited to do some work and mm -hmm. it's it's powerful actually and, and often when these transitions have happened we don't regret them we rarely regret them we often look back on those times and say well okay i didn't want to lose this but actually what i gained was this knowledge and this insight and i wouldn't have been able to do this other thing or help this other person had i not known it there's there's, uh -huh. there's always like a little a little seed there or something good absolutely i mean that's what i'm thinking what's interesting as you're talking uh, i'm thinking okay everything that you're saying about transformation that that mm. almost always our most important transformations come from difficult experiences or experiences mm. we would would not wish on others or that we didn't want for ourselves when i teach writing very often i'll say okay write down uh, the five you know the five experiences that that you would say in your life that shaped you the most profoundly right. yeah. and pretty much all of them are Bad. hard the hard <laughs> things yeah. and even even the one exception i would say is sometimes it's like you know um becoming a mother or a father becoming right. a parent but he, but we know that both of us as mothers that as joyous mm. as that is that's that's also a kind of crucible i mean there's nobody it's who's pretty wintry yeah yeah <laughs> yeah it's very yeah, wintry absolutely. and you know, so we know this. What's what's fascinating to me, um, and in my work as sugar, I often try to convince people of this. You are in a hard time, but it's a beautiful time. It's a powerful mm. time. It's a time mm. that you'll look back and maybe feel something close to gratitude for because it taught yeah. you something. So I think that wisdom that you share so lyrically and beautifully in your book is powerful important medicine i mean it felt like medicine for me to read it even if we all know that like sometimes it's something you know but you're like yes that's what i meant when i said i felt like we were 10. Yeah. but you know i think for me a question i kept wanting to ask you and, and you probably answered in the book but answer it for us here is <laughs> you know everything about these times that we're both describing we are all told to minimize them resist mm. them look on the bright mm. side um, plow through them as quickly as possible, yeah. uh, you know, avoid them, you know, try to do this to them rather than embrace them. Mm. And your book is so much about embracing those difficult yeah. times. And I'm curious, like how in your own life have you learned how to breathe through, sit through, mm. accept <laughs> the winters? Yeah. I think that one of the things I do is, is keep my body moving while my mind is like in that free floating state that that kind of comes with wintering 
And so, I, you know, I always like, I keep my hands moving. I keep making, I keep, for me, it's cooking. Like I know other people clean their house and I, I wish I had that capacity. It's like this, this kind of spark that I lack, unfortunately. <laughs> um, but I, I make and I, I bake and I pickle things. Like that's particularly my thing that I do. And I also walk a lot when I'm when I'm in that phase. And I, I will literally put a post-it note above my desk to say, go for a walk. So to remind myself to keep, just keep that kind of, it's not progress actually, but it, it is movement. And it, it's it's a kind of a flow, a fluidity that you, that you get from just being in transit. And I know that, you know, other people will do, do it differently to that, but it's, it's almost like if you let your body do some work, it, it helps your mind to settle and helps your mind to keep occupied. And I think in those, those really darkest moments, the big issue is often like what you do for the next five minutes rather than those big plans that your brain's trying to make and it can't yet. Mm -hmm. And you know, sometimes that's the only way we get through the day in those five, 10 minute chunks. So what am I going to do next? Okay, I'm going to make a cup of tea. Then I'm going to drink the tea. And then I might, you know, <laughs> I don't know, load the dishwasher. And then I might go for a walk. And and if we can keep, just keep ourselves occupied, it lessens the worst of the torment, I think. And it, and it makes space for your brain to do that background work that it needs to do without you interfering consciously. Yeah, it's, I mean, in so many ways, too, that that it's what mindfulness tells us a lot, right, which is be here now in the words yeah. of Ram Dass, right? And Ram Dass, is, yeah, yeah. And I love, you know, I love that about walking. I mean, mm. having written, we've both written books we've about both walking. written about and, crisis you know, walks. <laughs> that, you know, and frankly, even in walking, sometimes it's, I find that if I'm fretting about like, mm. oh my gosh, I have to walk 12 more miles before I can sleep tonight. That, that makes me miserable. But if I could just say, I'm going to take this step and the next step and the next step, you know, that's, that's a very kind of wintering state it of is. mind. I think, One foot you know? before the other. Yeah. One foot and before that, the other. I think I'm the really hard because I, I, people might not know, but my previous book was about a long walk I took when I learned I was autistic and I was I walked through winter so it was absolutely grim actually on this sort of coastal path and I was just I was often like pushing through driving rain and sleet I mean I lost my phone halfway through because it got smashed by the the hailstones that were flying at me it was like that bad <laughs> and what was and that book called Catherine it's the, uh, the electricity of, of every living thing yeah every living thing okay um, I'm gonna read that next yeah <laughs> that's your homework um but there were moments then when I, yeah, I was like looking at my map and just to get to the next point where I could take a break, it was miles and miles uphill, awful terrain. And I learned to try and walk from my skeleton rather than my muscles. It's like a, it's a running thing. Apparently I am not a runner. Um, but, but walking from my bones, let me kind of swing like a pendulum and just to keep moving forward and forget about my muscles. And I, I think that's a kind of similar insight almost like how can I, mechanically keep moving even when I feel in complete emotional stasis and exhaustion yeah that's a, that's I I relate to that I relate to that kind of walking. you've been there, <laughs> I've been there. <laughs> and and you know it, it, as you're talking to it made me think about actual winter and and trust me dear sister I know what actual winter is <laughs> I grew up in northern Minnesota did not have indoor plumbing or running water or electricity so we heated our house yeah. only by a wood stove that my stepfather built himself out of an old barrel. You and I share uh, something. We, we grew up poor. Yeah, um, And I know what it feels like to, mm. to have to endure the cold and what kind of endurance yeah. winter can be. And I, I'm curious if you can talk about that. I mean, I think that obviously both literally, um, you know, it's interesting. Um, and and metaphorically it is as well. But you write about uh, the, the 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 both the the beauty and the punishment of the cold. Mm. You write about the different experiences you have in putting yourself into the cold, cold water swimming, yeah. all yeah. Of that. But also about the ways that animals who go into hibernation mm. or torpor in the cold times um, to nurture themselves through that difficulty and survive. Tell us, talk to us about coldness. 
Mm, yeah, I know I it's a big a, question. All of those. No, things. it is. It's huge, and it's my favorite question. Um, because yeah, I grew up in a really cold house. You know, we had uh, we had no heating, we had no double glazing, we had one fire in one room. Um, and so yeah, my childhood experience was like getting undressed in winter, like huddled around one fire, so you got all your clothes on really fast, and then you got under the. It's just, and that, you know, that's a, it's a completely alien experience to any child. Um, you know, the vast majority of children now, it wasn't that unordinary at the time. Um, and it's funny because I think we can, I've, I've heard the cold sentimentalised a lot, you know, like, oh, we should all live in colder houses because then our bodies would work better. And, and it's actually really miserable living in a cold house. And yeah. What people don't talk about is like the walls go mouldy and it's it's just it's endlessly relentlessly grim and you end up going to bed early at night and you know yeah. because you're you're so cold and all that kind of you, thing. You have to go into a torpor yourself. You have to. <laughs> you're you're forced into it. And yeah. so I try really hard not to sentimentalize the cold in the book, but also to talk about the the weird complex balance that it brings to us because it also brings beauty and fascination particularly in snow and ice and all the kind of weather states and those clear winter days and in addition there seems to be an increasing body of scientific evidence that says that our bodies need the cold in order to like fulfill their full range of processing so i started cold water swimming um it's become much more popular now i was in yesterday um the water's down to 6.5 degrees centigrade now. So that's like, you know, six degrees above freezing. Um, it was chilly. Like at that stage, <laughs> the, the water's almost thick. Um, and I go cold water swimming now, partly because I know I can warm up afterwards, right? That's like an important part of it. Right. But also because of the huge release of serotonin and dopamine that, that comes when I do go in that cold water. And it, it gives me a, a literal high, there's no doubt about it, and a, and a kind of rush of connection and love for the world and pure joy. Like I laugh the whole time I'm in there, even though I'm freezing cold. And then I get out and I go back to my warm house and I know that it's safe. You know? Right. So there's this, there's this kind of dance that, that we make with the cold, that we can make with the cold now but which actually we need to make sure we feel it sometimes because it, it's part of the full scope of our humanity. And weirdly, it helps to cope with the, the doldrums that come in the, in the deep winter. Yeah, I mean, it actually physically, I mean, there's all kinds of research about that, mm, right? Amazing. But it sounds too, I mean, part of it, I, I'm curious, I will say your book, your book almost convinced me. <laughs> <laughs> Almost to push me. further, <laughs> but you know, I, I'm still, you know, so I grew up in northern Minnesota where there were a lot of Finnish immigrants, and right. um, yeah. they all had saunas. Everyone where yeah. I grew up had a sauna. I have a sauna too now in Portland, Oregon, and and you do the the really hot, and then you run into the out into the mm. snowbank or in the summertime into the water because uh, there's always a lake outside your door in yeah. Minnesota. Cool. Um, and I love that. I can go from the extreme from hot to cold. Because like you yeah. say, you know, you say, well, I know I can go home and get warm. But see, I need like an actual like room that's like 200 <laughs> degrees <laughs> right by the shore. <laughs> so it's it's very challenging. But, you know, it, to me, I was in Iceland this summer with my with my husband and son. And my daughter wasn't with us, sadly. But we, we went and had a little family trip. And they have the cold, the, the hot baths everywhere, the yeah. thermal baths every yeah, town, yeah. but they Amazing. have the cold plunge. And I have to tell you, it was, I, I did a few of them, but it was so hard, you mm. know, because everything in my body screamed, do not <laughs> no. do this. Okay. <laughs> and I don't think I'm alone in that. I, if all of yeah. you listening out there, you know, raise your hand if this is what your body says too. And I'm going to guess, Catherine, your body also says that. So what yeah, I'm curious no, about no, is like, it, it what's does, happening yeah. like, is part of the high that you overcame that, mm. like that you said, I'm going to, I mean, you, yeah. you know, it's part of the high that. It really is. It's, it's this feeling that you've been brave, actually. And I, I mean, I still, you know, what I'm three or four years into to swimming in the cold now, 
every time I feel this bodily reluctance, not just when I'm standing at the edge of the water, but when I'm arranging the swim with my friends and we're all like, oh, do we really want to do this? Yes, we do. We know we do. We know we'll <laughs> like it after. It, it's terrifying and it, it only gets worse, you know, and I've, I mean, I've swum when there's snow on the beach. I've swum when the water has got so cold that it's going like slushy at the edges, you know, and you have to kind of wade through slush to get in. Um, and I've, never never yet regretted it I will let you know if I ever lose any fingers or toes but I but you see part of it for me I think is the the way that I have to engage all of my mind in that activity to keep myself safe you know like I when I'm swimming in cold water I can't afford to not be noticing the exact state of my body it's incredibly mindful Mm -hmm. and when I hear now people who are cold water swimming and they're like setting a timer about how long they've got to stay in and they're competing about how far they swim Mm -hmm. when they're in and all that kind of thing that really troubles me because actually I don't think that's safe I think your body has everything it needs to tell you how long you should stay in and when to get out and I think the moment we disengage with that we not only make ourselves unsafe and risk hypothermia But we also lose some of the point of this, which is actually to reconnect and to on that kind of somatic level to understand our needs um, in a a very sort of nonverbal way. And I I worry about our competitive instinct around it, I have to say. Right. Because it it defeats the point. And I think, too, it's interesting because I know I have talked a lot about this when talking about long distance walking, where in nice. so many ways, the body, you know, enduring the suffering that you physically have to endure when you're doing something, whether it be running a marathon or hiking on a long trail or, you know, testing your body um, yeah. to its limits. In so many ways, what you're showing your psyche or your spirit, um, your mind, whatever word you want to use, all those other parts of us that we can survive and we can persist mm. and we can endure. And I, I think in a lot of ways, what you're doing here with the cold, it's, it's, it, it's has a corollary with those dark, difficult times in our lives. Like when we're, you know, when we're trying to heal a psychic or emotional wound or some kind of harm that's been done to us in the mm-hmm. past, almost always what you need to do, whether you do it as yourself through your writing or in therapy, is you actually have to step into it. You have to step yes. into that darkness. Yeah. The way, the same way you submerge yourself in that water, even though your body says, no, 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 yeah. it's safe up here. Like, but you're not really safe. Like if you don't step into the darkness, it, you can't really heal yeah. those wounds. Yeah. And so I, mean, I, I think in so many ways, this is what you're talking pain. about. Yeah. Yeah. It's so interesting to compare that to writing. I know exactly what you mean. I mean, I, I think particularly as a memoirist, there are those moments when you're skirting around the, painful bits or the the shame the, your shame your own shame actually I think it's a, a huge kind of barrier that you come across and to get really great writing out of that process you have to push through that wall there's um I don't know if you know the the wonderful tantra teacher Barbara Corellis but she has a phrase for this uh, that's the resilient edge of resistance which is that when we dance on the very edge between kind of pleasure and pain essentially mm-hmm. And she always describes it as well, you know how um, a cat will show you how to pet it. Like you put your hand out to a cat and it will meet you. Right. And the moment you do it too hard or you do it in the wrong place, like you you know absolutely about it. Like the cat will lead you through its pleasure and tell you absolutely when it's no longer pleasurable. Right. And, and we as humans have to learn to do that. I think because that's so often overridden in our culture as we're growing up. Um, and I think swimming in cold water, I think walking long distances, da 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 da. They they all are part of that dance on the resilient edge of resistance. And I love that. that. What a dance, great phrase! Right, lovely. It's a great phrase. Yeah, it applies so, to so many things. To those of you out there uh, listening to us, thank you for joining us. But we only have maybe five <laughs> or ten minutes left, and so if you have any questions, just pop them in the the thing below. I have a million more questions for Catherine, but like, I want to share the, I want to share the opportunity here. Um, oh, we've got a practical question, Catherine, from Christina. What oh, yeah. kind of gear do you use to cold water swim? Just a swimsuit or something else? I, I was also wondering that question. I was going to Google it after, you know, but 
What do you wear? I know different people I'm, wear different I'm a things. swimsuit girl. Yeah, I just a swimsuit. But I do wear neoprene socks. Yeah. So um, like the like kind of scuba divers do, because actually there's very little flesh on your feet and you will feel the cold. The cold really bites around your around the tops of your feet and it's horrible. So I wear little ugly neoprene booties that make me look terrible and a swimsuit. And always a bright coloured hat so that I can't get run over by any blasting jet skis. <laughs> that's my, that's how I fear I will go. Um, and a lot oh. of my friends actually wear gloves too, but I don't, I don't like the gloves so much for some reason. Yeah, but, I've um, heard the kind of extremities. And also the feet, you've got to walk to the shore. It's probably rocky. And I mean, protect yeah. your feet and hands. Yeah. Always protect your feet and hands. But yeah, the the main body. I I started off in a, an, in a wetsuit and honestly, it was just a pain to take on and off and it, took all the joy out of it for me so yeah the swimsuit is, is all I do okay okay <laughs> um now from Jen she says what wintering activity did you resist the most but ended up getting the most out of now and I wonder what she means like what comes to mind when you think of a wintering activity do you think literal winter or metaphorical winter <laughs> oh that's a that's a kind of <laughs> yeah <laughs> I mean, I think, um, I mean, I, I genuinely think that actually the, the cold water swimming is, is probably pretty near to that. Um, <laughs> but I, <laughs> there's also, I actually, to take this at a sideways angle, I think the, the part of wintering that I resisted the most instinctively were the kind of more ritual elements that I came to by the end of the book. You know, like I went to Stonehenge and took part in midwinter there and I, uh, engaged with the British Druids and asked them like what their what their worship is like how they how they use the the seasons to to sort of measure out the year and I began to engage in my own small rituals around my wintering and that I felt really embarrassed about it I felt mu it didn't feel brave and cool like cold water swimming did it felt silly and embarrassing and a little bit kind of furtive and shameful um, but it's it's the thing I've I've ended up leaning into the most and the thing I've ended up taking the most pleasure in. And now it feels very integrated in the rest of my life. And I I'm really glad I was able to embrace it. It felt very out of character, but actually having a like making ritual space to to deal with the meanings of the stuff that's happening is, is has been really life changing for me. And and do you mean by that you actually do you um, have rituals on the solstice and the equinox and do you celebrate yeah. those those passages which I, you wrote about in your book I think most of us know the winter solstice is approaching um, that we have the, the, the equinox and the summer so you know the, all of the mm -hmm. four but there's also in between each of those right every six weeks there's uh, some kind of passage or yeah. ritual yeah there's like a kind of in between one, in between the big solstices and equinoxes. Um, and uh -huh. when I spoke to Philip Cargom, who at the time was Britain's chief dru druid, he said, he, he showed me how essential they were. He said, like, if you're suffering, you've only ever got six weeks until the next moment in the year when you can gather and celebrate and mark. And he said, quite often, what that means is you see how far you've traveled between those two points in a way that you might not notice otherwise. So you, uh -huh. you think you're staying still, but actually, you can begin to see how things are moving. And I, I just thought that was a really beautiful, simple insight. And he said it, he said to me, like, it's okay to feel silly about this. I find mm -hmm. it a bit silly sometimes. Um, but all you have to do is go and do it. Um, right. And you and like let the meaning follow you. Like don't make the meaning, let the meaning come. Um, and so I, you know, like I often just light a candle or a bonfire at those points in the year. And if I'm if I'm struggling, I go looking for other people's ceremonies and festivals. Like I, right. I kind of go and hunt like what Saints Day is coming or or whatever. And I'll be like, well, okay, well, I I might just adopt that today. So yeah, yeah. I will. <laughs> and it it's nothing and it's everything. It for me, it, like it doesn't have to be big and constructed. It's a pause, and you can learn a little bit about whatever it is that other people are marking and there's always something you can take from it for yourself. And, and there's always something you can give to it too. And it's an exchange. Absolutely. I mean, and I think too, that kind of ritual is not just a pause. It's a, it's a pause in which we're also asked to um, think about meaning, find, you know, mm, like mm. allow, allow the, uh, the allow meaning of in. that moment to, yeah. 
to actually settle on us in a way mm. that feels really mm. powerful to me and gentle at the same time. There's yeah. a there's a wonderful ritual that I, I usually do on the other occasion of the winter solstice, which is just very near coming up. Very near, yeah. Um, you know, I'll just very often make a fire of some sort and um, have, I'll do this, but ask my kids to do it too, write, write down something that um, they would like to cast away, to let go of, to oh, release nice. and, yeah. and cast it into the fire. And, mm. you know, it, it always feels a little like a, like a corny game. And then I am always moved by the experience yeah. because one, it, it asks you to reflect, right? Mm, and and mm. and when you in that act of like finding that thing you want to let go of and casting it away, it, it becomes in so many ways, you know, very often the actual casting of it away is way more complex. But it be, feels like at least yeah. one gesture in the direction of transformation. I, I think gesture is such a useful word for all of this. It, it's so it's a small movement towards change. It's not like a, you know, like it. It's not like a big marching through the city bearing flags and. <laughs> playing trumpet you know <laughs> that's right that stuff is genuinely scary <laughs> but it, it's making those tiny gestures and it's the intent behind those gestures that are that are really transformative um and yeah i mean I, the solstice is coming up on the 21st as it does every year i'll be on the beach with my little bonfire um, but the difference is that now everybody's got to know about it so I've, i'm I've, i'm fielding text it's like are you doing anything for the solstice and could i come and it's like oh, that's so interesting people are beginning to cluster around my weird solstice stuff right but i will yeah. get up on my own the following morning because that that's the traditional like uh sort of pagan new year's day is the morning after the shortest day yeah um, and that's mine and mine alone and i i get up in my garden for that and watch the sunrise and that's that's a lovely moment for me that's wonderful. Yeah, I do the same thing. I always think of my my little mantra at the winter solstice is honor the darkness, welcome mm -hmm. the light. And that is what I love about, I mean, so much of what you write about in wintering and so much about that kind of ritual of, of pausing and remembering, okay, thank you, darkness, for all you have given me, for all you teach mm -hmm. me. Thank you, light, for all you have given me and all you teach me. And I think that mm -hmm. that, that dichotomy, which you grapple with so elegantly and interestingly in your book you know it's everywhere in literature it's everywhere in religion it's and everywhere. by religion i mean any spiritual belief system yeah. whether it be paganism or christianity or judaism you know it's Absolutely. and on and on and on um islam it's always this mm. the darkness and light within us the darkness and light in the world the darkness and light that we can create as communities and countries and global citizens so it's powerful stuff and thank you for this beautiful okay. book and this beautiful medicine Catherine oh thank you it's it's lovely to talk about it and particularly approaching this time of the year I kind of my thoughts are circling at the moment so so really any nice. if, uh, if there are any more questions pop them in right now because we are going to have to say mm -hmm. um goodbye but here we go a few viewers would love to hear you share oh, a bit yeah. of how your son wintered Oh, yeah. that's a big question at the end of things. It's like, yeah, <laughs> how did you I will, I will do my did, best. To... <laughs> how did we come out of it? How do we how do we parent our kids through their winters? You know, if we had more time, that was one thing I was going to ask you myself, yeah. um, because you write about this in your book. Like one of the three powerful experiences that you they wrote about is seeing your son struggle mm. and suffer and go through his own wintering. Yeah, so to, to outline briefly, um, there came a point when I had to pull my son out of school because he was so stressed and anxious about going. Um, and, you know, we we did everything we could working with the school, but their attitude was that we just had to force him in after a while. It was just sort of tough and, and he had to go to school and I couldn't I couldn't do it. Uh, and so I did made the very heavy decision for me to pull him out of school because I, I hadn't exactly dreamed of being a homeschooling parent. Right. Um and we, again, we actually opened up some space. I mean, he was so young, you know, like kids in the UK, uh, like by the time you guys start proper school, ours are supposed to have learned to read and do all sorts of things that, you know, like we do it very early compared to most societies. And some kids just can't do it at that point. And it's right. so hard on them. And they deal with this massive sense of failure and isolation and loss and shame. And it's, it's horrible for some. And it was true for my son. So we pulled him out of school and um, I didn't know what to do and he didn't know what to do. And so we just spent some time together and we 
went and built dens in the wood and we went and picked flowers and like made wreaths and cooked and read books that we enjoyed together and watched movies and just existed for a while while we figured it out and it uh, and we took some time and I'm really glad we did and there's a he he went back to school after nine months uh, and he he loves school now so it was really yeah he needed some time um and he but he was very reflective about the experience you know it was very traumatic at the time and we we made we made time to think about it and and that means now that he's incredibly reflective about other people's suffering and really perceptive mm-hmm. about what it means to need help and he's also very good at telling me when the pressure's building up and saying I, I need a break and I give him a break um which doesn't always go down that well with the school truancy officer but but there we go that, that's okay right. I, can, I can face that one off um but I, I would love to, seeing as we're ending, I'd love to end on a really lo- a really nice story because actually one of the first things we did was we went into the woods and we built a kind of a den with twigs and we made like a kind of tented structure and sat in it and drank hot chocolate. And after he'd gone back to school and then the pandemic kicked off, we went back to the woods to that same place. And we found that some, that one or many other people had built on our little den that we made and it was much much bigger and it was all around this tree and I remember saying to him like other children have come and they've found what you made and they in their own times of crisis and they've inhabited it as well so you you pass that on to them and I I loved that as a as an idea and as a wonderful metaphor that actually there we go that's how our winterings offer something to the next people on if we can externalize it and share it there it is we, we make a, a structure that other people can come and live in oh that's so beautiful <laughs> and so true i mean to normalize retreat as a healthy response mm. to hardship and stress and and turmoil or uncertainty yeah. you know i think that that is one of the most powerful gifts that this this book gives us and the more we talk about that kind of thing um, not seeing, I mean, the very word retreat, it's not, it's not giving up. It's, 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 yes. it's, it's, it's not stepping away necessarily. It's stepping away from one realm so that we can step into another. Mm-hmm. So your son mm-hmm. did that. That's so beautiful and powerful. And, and Catherine, I hope he'll carry on doing it forever. <laughs> oh, I'm sure he will. And, and like anyone, I mean, that's the thing too, this question being about parenting, you know, I have two teenagers and it has, there's no question that the last couple of years in the, through the yeah. pandemic have been really, I not, I, I was going to say some of the most difficult parenting mm. years of my life, but I'm going to say, Absolutely. no, yeah, not some of yeah. the yeah. most difficult yeah. and to see my kids struggle and to, to um, see them endure a, a kind of forced wintering in some way. Um, I think that, that this has been, you know, a time that a lot of us have had to say, what are we going to learn from this experience where we've been forced back out of out of the life that we might um, have expected to be having in this moment? So it's it's a per you know, I don't think you planned this book to be published in the midst of no, a pandemic. I didn't, no, <laughs> but no. it worked out pretty well, didn't it? Yeah, I I've had a good pandemic, but I it's been it for me it's been lovely because I've been able to go out and help, which is what I love to be able to right. do, like I, I want to help. Um, yeah. I'd have felt very helpless if I hadn't been on Zoom talking about this book, and I'm really grateful to have been able to do it. Well, thank you for talking to oh, me and to the, to everyone here today, listening to you um, share your wisdom and truth and beauty. And all of you, if you have not read this fantastic mm-hmm. book, please do. It's really good. Mine doesn't have there a cute go. sticker. I want your cute sticker. Oh, it's you didn't, did, they, it's they shiny. didn't send you. They got to no, send you one. a. a <laughs> This copy, see, it, says, it says Cheryl Strayed Wild Reads Book Club, Literati Book Club. I, it's we'll we'll send you one. I love it. <laughs> All right. And anyone out there, you want to join my book club, you get you get a book every month with that cute sticker on it. And just go to Literati. Mm. Um, check them out on Twitter or Instagram and or on the web and you can sign up. And Catherine, I cannot wait to read your next book, which is going to actually be your last book. The book yes. before you run. <laughs> yeah, you can move about back walking in time with me. <laughs> um, I'm a fan forever of your work, oh, and so thank, thank you, you so much, much for enriching my life with it. Thank you. It's been lovely. All right. To you. Happy trails, everyone.